Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again to As I Live and Grieve. Thank you, thank you so much for tuning back in week after week. I really appreciate it from all of you, and whether you know it or not, you have all helped me immensely on my grief journey as well. Another great guest. I always have great guests, don't I? I think, I don't know, Do they? are they attracted to me? I think I find them. It doesn't matter. They're all great. With us today is Vicki Paris Goodman. She's an author of a book called To Sam With Love. That just sounds like such a sweet, sweet title. Also with me, of course, is Kelly, younger daughter, Texas resident. She's with me again today as co-host. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks so much, Nikki, for taking time out of your schedule. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Kathy. Oh, you're very, very welcome. It's definitely our pleasure, actually. Before we get started with my questions, and I always have numerous questions, would you just do us a favor and tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Sure. I was born in, and lived the first 61 years of my life in the Los Angeles area. I'm a Valley girl. I grew up in Studio City, went to North Hollywood High, and I moved in 2016 to Prescott, Arizona with my husband, Sam. We moved there for retirement, and that's where I live today. I did lose Sam to cancer not too long after we moved here, just a couple of years. That was completely unexpected. And I decided to write the book, To Sam With Love. The subtitle is A Surviving Spouse's Story of Inspired Grief. And I know inspired grief sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but I kept that in the subtitle because it really describes, I think, what I experienced after Sam died. I just want to tell you a little more about myself. I'm a retired mechanical engineer and real estate appraiser. I play violin semi-professionally. I sing and I served a Long Beach area newspaper in California for over 20 years as their theater critic. That is what I would call an eclectic background. <laughs> for sure. I love it. I love it though. I love it. But you certainly are invested in the arts. I can say that very, very easily. Well, you know, having been a mechanical engineer, I think the arts kind of balance, balance that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You. It was good of you to realize that you needed that balance. I think I know a bunch of engineers that could use a little more balance in their lives. (laughs) We won't go there. No. Okay, let's get started. You lost your husband, Sam, by cancer. I lost my husband, Tom, by cancer. His was a brain tumor. So you and I have that parallel in our lives already. We also have that component where you mentioned inspired grief. I called it for a long time intentional grief because... At the point in my life that I realized I don't want to live like this for the rest of my life, that moment you have that you are probably five days with no shower, maybe the same clothes, you've hardly eaten anything, and you just realize that you cannot go on this way. You need to do something. At that point, that was when I knew that I had to do something, and I had to do it intentionally, or I was just going to wither away. I mean... People weren't going to contact me. I wasn't going to go anywhere. I was just going to exist until I no longer existed. I didn't want that. I still had things to live live for. I had both my daughters. I have grandkids. I have, well, again, my friends. I don't want to talk about my friends. But there were things I had to live for. There were a lot of things I wanted to do before I gave up. So I turned things around and I experienced, I think, what you talked about inspired grief. But could you elaborate for us a little bit more? What do you mean by inspired grief for you? Yes, I'm glad you asked, Kathy, because I think it was maybe a little different for me than what you described. You know, everybody's grief is different. But what happened to me, yeah, what happened to me, though, was, well, let me just say first that I was raised in a secular family. Now, I'd begun while Sam was still alive to sort of accept 
a higher power. But I couldn't okay. take him that very far. And at the point he died, I realized that his continued existence for me depended on a stronger belief okay. in both God and an afterlife. What happened the day he died is I felt lost and at the same time flooded with optimism. This was so unexpected. I'm not a particularly optimistic person. I'm kind of middle of the road. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. pessimistic. I'm not optimistic. I'm just kind of in the middle. But what was happening to me was just so surprising. I felt like a helping hand was coming from somewhere outside myself to guide me and lead me. And I'm kind of a control freak. So the fact that I let myself be led is sort of astounding as well. It was just also, hmm. it was it was uncharacteristic of me. At least that's the way I saw it. I thought, what's happening right. to me? This isn't my nature. So that's what I call inspired grief. Okay. Because after... Not only that, but all these coincidental things that there were too many of them to really be chalked up to coincidence. The first couple. Like what? Yeah, I'll tell you about some of them. Okay. For, exact, for example, a couple of them happened while Sam was still alive. Like, for example, I was trying to get him into a, a clinical trial for an immunotherapy the, the, that was better for his cancer than the one he was scheduled to get when he finished his chemotherapy. I couldn't, he didn't qualify. And I was so frustrated one night after we went to bed, I couldn't sleep. I was getting more and more agitated. And I, so I got up, I grabbed my tablet, I closed the doors up to the bedroom so that I wouldn't waken Sam. And I took my tablet into the den and just started banging on it just to let off steam, you know, when will nivolumab be approved for hepatocellular carcinoma? Mm -hmm. Well, the strangest thing happened. This post came up that was about 10 or 12 hours old. This immunotherapy had been approved for Sam wow. liver cancer that very day. That was the first wow. thing that happened. Yeah. And then I was on my way to his celebration of life about a month after he died mm -hmm. that I would be hosting. Uh, I had it at a little venue and I was about maybe only a quarter mile from the venue driving my car on the street the venue was on and suddenly there was this cartoonish little blue car, kind of like a Volkswagen bug, but something else. I don't know what it was. And Sam's f favorite flower had always been sunflowers. Well, on... Okay. On this little car, there was like a plastic flower sticking up from the roof and it was bent back so that I could clearly see that it was a sunflower. Oh, for goodness sakes. I mean, when did you ever see a flower sticking up? For, it was just, yeah, it, it was, yeah. I, I'd never had that experience before. And I have a list of yeah. about five other things too. So yeah. Seren serendipity was playing an outsized role in everything that happened after Sam mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you know, if your mind hadn't been open to those things, you would have missed them. That's, the you know, other, if for whatever reason you had an open mind. Well, that's the thing because I'm the most unobservant person I know. And again, this <laughs> stuff isn't my nature. So again, more evidence that something from outside me, uh, that helping hand again, was mm -hmm. coming down to do something for me or show me that maybe Sam was hovering around, you know, mm -hmm. to, to yep. bolster yep. me. Yeah. Yep. Yep. If you allow things like that to happen, um, I now believe, I didn't used to, but I now okay. believe that if you open yourself to receiving things like that, they'll be there. Those signs will be there. Okay. I used to joke about you cannot get something by sitting at home and waiting for it, whatever it is you're looking for, to come up to your door and knock on your door. That's not going to happen. You have to go look for it. But I now believe that if you are ready for it, just go out and walk around. It'll find you. Well, you know, you're absolutely right, Kathy, because not only did these things happen, but the timing of each and every one of them was yes. so crazy, serendipitous. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I love that word serendipity. It just sounds so happy. It, it really does. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I don't know. I just, I love words. Certain words do certain things to me and serendipity to me means happy. happy. It's a cute word. It is. So you had this 
inspired grief, which makes sense now as it pertains to you. And is that still with you? Yes. Uh, One of the crazy things that happened is still happening. It happens almost every night. And that is, and I write about it in the book, soon after Sam died, I, I would get in bed and turn out the lights to go to sleep. And just a few minutes later, before I really had fallen asleep, this smoky grayish white thing would kind of appear. And I thought, sometimes it was so subtle, I wasn't even sure it was there. And I thought, oh, this is just a manifestation of my eyes growing accustomed to the dark. But sometimes it would really be pretty vivid. And a few months later, it changed color. It changed to neon yellow green. And it's still still neon yellow green. And I tell the story of how I confirmed that this was indeed Sam's soul, a manifestation of Sam's soul. How did you confirm it? Well, okay, I'll tell you. All right. So one night, about a year after Sam died, I was really growing weary of wondering if this thing had anything to do with Sam. You know, I wanted it to be Sam. And I said, I said to God, I said, listen, you know, I don't ask for things for myself. I always pray for other people, but I'm going to make an exception. I really need to know at this point if the neon yellow green thing is Sam. So I have a plan. This is what you can do. I said, tonight, after I turn out the lights, if you would just make the neon yellow green thing more vivid than ever, and just make it look different than it ever has, more more there than it ever has before. And if it's not mm-hmm. Sam, if it's not Sam, just give me jet black because that also would be different. And I figured I had nothing to lose because if it just appeared the same way it always had, it just meant God had chosen not to do what I'd asked. So that night I was almost afraid to go to bed. I thought, what have I done? You know, what if I get jet black. Am I ready to find out this hasn't been Sam all this time? But I can't stay up forever. So I go to bed and I turn out the light. And usually the neon yellow green thing took about three to five minutes to appear after I got in -hmm. in bed. And it would gently float around for about 45 seconds to a minute and then just kind of fade off. So that night I turn out the lights and it's there immediately never happened before and it is vivid as can be and instead of floating around it goes it goes it just kind of frantically shoots across my view horizontally (laughs) about three or four times and then really really rapidly and then gone Mm. so I burst into tears and I thank God for confirming the identity of Mm -hmm. the apparition and I've never questioned questioned it again Hmm. Interesting. And do you still have that with you every night when you go to bed? Just about. And what's interesting is about three months ago, it's been four and a half years since Sam died. About, okay. three, uh-huh. about three months ago, the neon yellow green thing started not always, but sometimes being accompanied by another one kind of alongside it that was is mm-hmm. a vivid violet color, you know, hmm. kind of a reddish purple. The most gorgeous shade of violet you've ever seen otherworldly it's not Mm -hmm. always there or sometimes it's real faint but boy when it's vivid it is stunningly gorgeous and i have no idea what that is i was just going to ask you if you had any identity yeah well i keep asking Mm -hmm. sam if he's with our our greyhound sid and and he never answers me and i'm thinking gee maybe the the violet apparition is (laughs) sid i i don't know i have no idea what who knows who knows I love those. I love those stories. I, I wish I had some visits like that. But, you know, at the time they happened, if they first happened, they'd probably freak me out. It'd probably take me a little bit before I really had a chance to fully understand them. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's so, so interesting. So it, what was your why for writing your book? Why did you feel you needed to put it into writing? A couple of things. First of all, I'm a writer because I did theater reviews for over 20 years for that paper in Long Beach, and I love writing. But after about two years from the time Sam died, and I'd had like seven of these strange occurrences... I had opportunities and possibilities just coming my way there for the taking. And I was somehow motivated to grab all of them and do them. And they were all successful. And then these insights came. And a couple of the best ones uh, happened after I published the book. So they're not in the book. But all of this put together, 
I thought could really help other surviving spouses or or people who have lost any loved one because I moved forward so easily and with such clarity. And I know it came from outside myself, so I'm nothing special. But, well, I really feel this this is not characteristic of me. You know, I know. I, I, know yeah, I, I being, get it. I was being helped. And I want to admit mm-hmm. that to people. And I want them to remember how secular I started because, you yeah. know, this is not, I've never believed in most of these things. Yet they mm-hmm. happened to me and I'm just here to tell about it. So that's why I wrote the book because I really felt it had the potential to completely upend the way we look at death and loss and grief and mm-hmm. our futures after loss. Yeah. Well, I have not yet had a chance to read your book because it was very quick from the time that you and I were introduced until we got to do this podcast right. with good reason, with good reason. I love to have guests on that have personal stories as well, because I think it really helps our listeners identify with someone else who's gone through something similar. It's never going to be exactly alike. There are going to be parallels. There are going to be differences. But it always helps us as grievers to know that we're not alone, that there are other people out there too that have been devastated. They have lost someone so vital to them yet they continue to go on. We all need that hope, that inspiration. And at the same time, it helps us identify. It helps us build our own personal community. Even if we never meet the person, we know they're there. We know they're there and that they have struggled and they are doing better each day. Mm -hmm. Now, it's no secret that I will grieve for the rest of my life. I say it all the time. It's been almost six years since my husband Tom died. There are days that are easy. Some days they're a little more difficult. I have never returned to that first devastation that I felt. And Kelly was with me in those days. She came up from Texas to be with me at that time. And she knows what I went through. And then once everybody kind of goes their own way and it's just you, you sink back down again. I've never gone way back there. But yeah, some days are difficult. Yeah, there's some days that I get these little twinges and I start to feel bad. And then it turns around again. We talked a bit about open minds, open hearts, and that's kind of become not really a theme for me, but a real belief of mine lately, because I found that by really keeping myself open, so many great things are happening to me now. They're just almost in droves. They're coming. It's almost horrifying to think just all this goodness that's coming my way. And I love it. I'm loving every minute of it. So as we talk about your book, I understand your reason for wanting to write it. And I thank you for that. And I know our listeners will too. And we will make sure that our listeners know the name of the book so they can look for it as well. Did you find that writing the book helped you on your grief journey? Everybody asks me that, Kathy. Yes and no. Uh, No, I I think the answer is no in the way most people mean it. In other words, I think they're asking if it was a cathartic experience to write it. I think after two years from when Sam died, which is when I wrote the book, I think I was kind of past the point of needing a catharsis or where it could really be that. But, But it was really good in that it got me to really start organizing the memories and Mm -hmm. getting them into a narrative for myself and everybody else, obviously, who would read the book. But it was really good for myself to come up with these stories so I could tell them in the book and say, Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And it made me so happy. There was very little that I remembered that was sad. It was almost all things that made me laugh or smile. You know, Sam was a very funny man for one thing. So I remembered a lot of his jokes. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Humor's always played a big part. You know, Tom was the same way. He was very, very funny. He had lots and lots of friends and they all had great sense of humor too. And some of them, God bless them, they even brought it to his celebration of life. I remember Tim Horton's coffee cup in particular that made me break out in laughter at his celebration. And then, of course, I was embarrassed that I, the widow, had done that. But eh, I got over it. I think everybody else did, too. And those that knew Tom understood that that Tim Horton's coffee cup 
meant everything to him. So with the writing and everything and with your grief, now what you experienced knowing that Sam had cancer and this was a terminal diagnosis and at some point he was going to get to the end of his life. There's a lot of talk about anticipatory grief and how it may or may not prepare you for that day. Do you feel that you were prepared in your anticipatory grief? Yeah, I have to admit I was. When we first got that diagnosis, I drove to this because I didn't want Sam to see me extremely upset. So right. for an every afternoon for an entire week, I drove to this Starbucks in, in the town where we live, where there I knew there was a patio out back that hardly okay. anybody ever used. And I knew I could just sit there and be alone. So I, nice. I drove over there and sat there and cried my eyes out for about an hour every day for a week until mm. I decided that the ritual had sort of served its purpose and I needed to move on. And I did stop crying after that. And I think I did mm. a lot of anticipatory grieving that week. Now, that's not to say that I didn't have anxiety and all kinds of other manifestations of grief during that time when it was getting closer to his passing. So, yes, you know, that's subject to interpretation. I don't think the question can really be answered as to whether if you really suffer that anticipatory grief, whether you can completely eliminate the effects of the death when it actually happens. I can't imagine right. that that is the reason I did so well afterwards, after he yeah, died. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think uh, the anticipation, I, I, we had eight months almost to the day from the day he was given his terminal diagnosis until the day he took his last breath. And I can say that period of time, although I was busy every moment, taking care of him until he was in a facility when I could no longer safely do it. Um, but then I was spending my time going back and forth to visit with him and keep him company and try to keep him engaged and interact with him. Um, it, I think, if anything, it prepared me for the moment of his death, but it did not prepare me for much beyond that. I guess I would say. I'd have to qualify it that way. I do remember leaving the facility after he died, walking to my car in the parking lot, and I had a brief moment where I was overwhelmed with gratitude that that was finally over, that it was finally done, and it was time to move in a different direction. But then within moments, the tears came on, and then I started living that devastation that everyone lives. It just confirms for me the fact that everyone's grief is different. Every situation is different. Every person is different. You're at a different point in your life, financially, emotionally, uh, everything, physically even. So anticipatory grief can prepare you for parts of it, but it still doesn't prepare you for the reality that you have to deal with after someone you love is gone. Right. Would you agree with that? I, I would completely agree with that. Well said. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. All right. One more thing I want to focus on before it'll be time to wrap up. I have found that my grief has, in some ways, helped me, motivated me, empowered me, inspired me to do something more with my life than I may have intended or thought I intended. Have you found that? Well, yes. <laughs> Writing the book is the obvious thing. But honestly, it turned out I could sing. I never knew that before. Now I sing in public. Oh, yeah. I even I even auditioned for a staged reading not long after Sam died at our community playhouse. And I got the female lead in the play. I mean, this is what That's I amazing. mean by inspired grief. This is crazy stuff. And it was just happening for me. I moved on in that way. But I think the culmination was the writing of the book uh, okay. and now trying to talk about it with you and others. Yeah. 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 I, I, it's fascinating to me. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to focus on now. I'm also working on a book. I'm working on several things, but I do want to kind of let people know that at some point it, it can turn around. You can use what you are experiencing to help propel you, if you will, if you'll allow me to use that word, to help propel you in a different direction that perhaps you never thought of, but maybe is really one of the signs on the road to, yo, over here, you're supposed to be over here doing this. Yeah. I feel like it's helped to me 
So what would you say, and I know you've got something right on the tip of your tongue, I can see it, but what also would you say to people who are grieving so that they can use their grief to be inspired? I, the, one of the main things I learned right after Sam died was that being open to the guidance I spoke about earlier and being not just that, but being open to opportunities and possibilities that come your way, you know, things that maybe you couldn't have done while you were married because the marriage took up certain, certain, um, amounts of time, social time, whatever. And now suddenly you're free to maybe look in a different direction and be open to that. It could expand your your world so much. And the other thing I would also tell listeners is what worked for me, and I have a feeling it would work for most people, is to strike a balance between activity and alone time. People said, keep yourself as busy as possible. I know they were trying to help, but I ignored their advice. I knew that was the wrong path. You have to process what's happened to your life after you lose the love of your life. But you also don't want to cocoon and roll up into a ball and do nothing. So you strike a balance between the two. And the alone time can be spent hiking, walking, watching TV, you know, just sitting and thinking, reading, but just quiet time, you know? Um, And boy, that sure worked for me. In fact, just an interesting little side note is that was working so well for me that when COVID hit just a few months after Sam died, It really upset that balance. And that was the Mm -hmm. only time after he died that I actually suffered a couple of really devastating depressions, which curiously Uh. each lasted exactly 10 days. And and I knew it was because of all the angst around, you know, the pandemic and nobody knew what was going on, but also because that, that balance between activity and alone time was completely upset And suddenly I was spending way too much time alone. Yeah. So I know the balance was the key. Balance is definitely a critical word. And we talk about self-care a lot. And part of that is to find some balance. I find some of the times that I have where I am alone, I am not lonely. Mm -hmm. I am alone. And some of that is some of the most precious time I have. I I have a chance to focus to think, you're doing pretty good, Kath. Or, you know, you better get back on the ball because you're kind of slipping there. I can talk to myself. I can just do nothing. I love especially to be in the woods or at the beach on a cruise ship with a margarita. Never mind. (laughs) But I, I love to be somewhere and just have that time where I don't really have to do anything except breathe. And that's automatic. So I'm good to go. Yes. Good to go. I agree with with everything except the margarita. I'll take the gin martini. All right. That's fair enough. I'll buy you one. (laughs) Anyway, uh, it has come time now for us to wind down and say our farewells. But before I do that, I want to turn the microphone over to you and let you speak directly to our listeners without me interrupting you with questions. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. uh, What I want to do is... Give a gift to the listeners. Um, Now that listeners, you've heard some of the insights and revelations and serendipitous events that I experienced after my husband Sam died, I've actually reserved the most startling uh, insights for a three-part series. It's an audio series I've recorded that's available for free. I generally offer this series to audiences of uh, my speaking engagements, and I even took a told a, taught a course at one point and those things. But for a limited time, I'm offering the series to podcast listeners. Please take advantage of this. It is really worthwhile. These audio clips will upend the way you think of death and loss. And if you're stuck in grief, they will allow you to move on. The three episodes are about 10 to 14 minutes in length each. And just visit inspiredgrief.com. Enter your email address and you will uh, get 
uh, limited access, limited time access to those three episodes. And these important concepts will really uh, assist you in moving on. I promise. So I wanted to offer, offer that to everyone. And uh, Kathy, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I can't wait for those audio clips. I don't, how about you, Kelly? I'm, I'm, oh, I'm eager now. I got to have those. Um, I, yeah. You know, thank you, Vicki, so much. I, I know that you're working on a second book. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to tell everybody about that? Sure. It's called Speed Bumps and Other Impediments to Life in the Fast Lane. It's about the trials and tribulations of life, but especially from the perspective of a type A personality. It's it's pretty self-deprecating. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And as soon as I can get back to it, it will be done shortly. And uh, then I'll be able to talk about that book on, on interviews as well. Well, I'll have to find a reason to just have you back for a guest again, <laughs> won't we? That that will be fun. I always love it when guests come back. So I'm sure that will be no problem at all. Oh, good. We'll keep our eyes peeled for that one as well. Now, do you have a newsletter on your website or anything, a way have- that people can stay in touch? I have a blog. My Now, inspiredgrief.com is the domain where the three episodes are, but I have a website. I also have a website, Vicky Paris Goodman. That's Vicky, V-I-C-K-I, Paris, like the city in France, goodman.com. And there are some reviews of the book there. There's a, there's a blog with some interesting articles I've written and posted there. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a good, and they can contact me there. Super, super. That sounds like it would be some time well spent and keep you away from some of those rabbit holes, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all over the internet. Yeah, the blogs, did you? Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. I haven't made it there yet, but uh, I certainly will. Oh, I'm so glad, Uh, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Kelly, did you have any questions for Vicki before I wrap up? I guess the only question I would ask is, okay, so my father passed away about uh, 12 years ago, and... I don't think I've processed it yet fully. Um, I was caring for his wife and stepdaughter during that time. And then I just got angry after the way they treated me after his death. So I never processed it. I just moved on. Um, Any suggestions on where I could start? Yeah. Recognize that God has a plan for you. That's one of the things I talk about in these three audio episodes And that plan is there to give you certain experiences and teach you certain lessons while you're here on earth. So when something bad happens, people treat you badly or some other, you know, everything from a bad hair day to, you know, your house burns down. Whenever those things happen, I would encourage you, because I've learned this way too late in life, encourage you to say, what is God's intended takeaway here? And just, I think when you think about it that way, it makes, it begins to make sense of the loss, the way you were treated, because you're supposed to learn things while you're here. Right. I am convinced of it. So maybe start thinking, yeah, so maybe start thinking of, of these things that way. I, I don't know if that helps you, Kelly, but, but I think it might be a start. Yeah, it gives me a jumping off point. I really appreciate it. It makes a lot of sense. Of Thank course. You. Sure. You're welcome. Great, great insight. Great question, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. So it is now time, sad to say, to say goodbye. Remember self-care. And self-care can be as simple as tuning into our podcast. You're taking care of yourself. You're connecting with people who are traveling a similar path. Or if you happen to be supporting someone who is grieving, maybe it might give you some additional insight into what they may be feeling by hearing us speak. And we speak very candidly about our feelings and the difficulties as well as the triumphs. Vicki, again, I want to say thank you so much. Kelly, thanks for joining me today. You're both coasting alongside with me (laughs) and to our listeners thank you for tuning again and again and please 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 come back again next time as we all continue to live and grieve thank you so much for listening with us today do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes please email us at info at as i live and grieve dot com and let us know We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.